Today we're going to continue our series of five reptiles that make great pets from every continent. Today we're going to start with the continent that is the cradle of civilization, Africa. The one that I'm going to give a pretty softball one to, but maybe talk about some ones that you don't necessarily quite think about. So we're going to start off one that I think gets overlooked quite a bit, and that is the house snake, or the cape house snake, sometimes referred to as. These guys occupy pretty much all of sub-Saharan Africa. So that means is there's the big Sahara Desert. Pretty much everything south of there, they can occupy. They prefer areas where it's kind of like a dry savanna, but with usually places with, you know, heavy or consistent sources of water. And you'll find them often around areas where humans are. They probably both choose those areas for the same reasons. And a lot of times you'll also find, because of humans, the house snakes, which is why they get their name. They're in and around houses, attracted by rodents that are attracted by people. They make wonderful pets. These guys are very mild tempered. They don't get very long, only about two to three feet. And they have several different color uh, morphs to them. I don't know if morphs is necessarily the correct term for that, um, but maybe phases. So they can be kind of like a light olive brown color. They can be sometimes a dark chocolatey color, even to almost black. And a lot of times you'll actually see those is the olive house snake or the black house snake or the black cape house snake. These guys are really cool. They're fairly diurnal because they're an active colubrid species. They do like to bask. So if you want to give them some nice UVB, um, give them nice places to bask, plenty of places to crawl, move around. Um, and again, because this is an active colubrid species, if you give them the space, you will see them utilize it more than like say a ball python or a boa constrictor or something like that. Um, they are really cool, but another really cool fun fact about these guys is that their family or lamp for fear day, um, or yeah, no, no sorry, lamp of food, lamp of fee day. There we go. Lamp of fee day. That family is actually very closely related to a lapids. So the cobras, the mambas, the sea snakes, those things. So genealogically, the black house snake is more closely related to the black mamba or several types of elapids. I don't know if necessarily the black mamba, but elapid type snakes than they are to other colubrids, which is absolutely crazy. This next one I think is really cool for a pretty obvious reason. And this is the Spider-Man Agama. So these guys come from pretty rocky, dry, arid regions around Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya, and they get their name for a pretty obvious reason, although that is just the males. This is a fairly sexually dimorphic species where the males have that bright red and blue coloration and the female are more drab, um, which doesn't necessarily have to do with like defense about watching the babies or the nest because they don't really do that a whole lot, but it's mostly used to get attention for the females. Um, these guys make very good pets and they do turn up in the trade, in the hobby. I believe both in Europe and in the US. Um, they're very, so these guys are in a gama. So sometimes it's also called the Spider-Man Iguana or the Spider-Man Rock Agama. Not Iguana, Agama. That's a big species of lizard. Um, has a whole bunch of ones like bearded dragons for lizards. They're all agamended lizards. Sorry about that. Um, very active, very diurnal. Um, very crazy, high energy insectivore as far as lizards go. So when you have their enclosure, you want to make sure you give them lots of large, heavy rocks for them to move around, climb, bask. They will do their little agama head bob like you'll see bearded dragons do too if you have quite a few of them. Um, I would recommend not having multiple males in the same enclosure. Maybe have different groups of like one male to two to three females. But who knows, if you had a whole room, you could have a huge colony of them, which I think would be really, really cool to watch. Um, but these guys are really fun, so if you're gonna have them set up, make sure that you give them a nice, warm, hot basking spot over 100 degrees, but plenty of places for them to get away because they will only come out and bask for small amounts of time, and the rest of the time they'll be spent in other parts of the enclosure. Also making sure you give them some place that has a little bit of humidity, like a nice little human hide, like an overturned half log or something like that. All right, I had to do it. I had to talk about it. I don't normally like to do the easy ones. That's why I don't do a species spotlight on these guys because everybody already knows everything about them or most people think they know everything about them. But I got to talk about it because they are arguably the most popular pet reptile. Although bearded dragons are a pretty heavy contender for that. Um, ball pythons. So these guys are found in sub-Saharan tropical Africa out of Togo, Ghana, a little bit of Benin. These guys are heavily exported for a very long time, although the numbers are finally starting to go down a little bit. So everybody knows about the ball python. So this little python, known as the royal python in the rest of the world, 
They achieve, you know, four to five feet in length, sexually dimorphic, females being larger. Although there are in one part of the range, in the northern part of the range, which is in the cradle of the Volta Mountain Range, where a specific bloodline and groups of them seem to be larger. And those, for the most part, are considered the Volta or the Sub-Saharan ball pythons, where those are the ones that can achieve that close to six foot, six foot plus length. But those are very few and far between, even from animals with that lineage. These guys are very good pets for obvious reasons. Um, between just this normal one, like Kalamazoo here, who is a wonderful animal ambassador, um, for their, you know, fairly docile disposition, for their fairly sedentary lifestyle, and for the crazy amount of morphs that exist, which these guys are essentially what changed the entire reptile hobby. And I did a whole video about that. You want to check it out. Hopefully I remember to put it right here. Technically, it started with the albino Burmese pythons, but these guys put it into every house. Um, I do really like them. Everybody poo-poos on ball pythons. They call them the pet rocks. Even I do it, but these guys do make very good pets. They make great ambassador animals, and I do, in fact, love ball pythons. They are really, really, really cool. Um, another final fun fact about these, because there is a little bit of misinformation being thrown out there, although I don't really like that term, so I probably shouldn't use it. But, so there's a thing that's been going around for a little while. That these guys are being found up in trees, and so there is a little bit of truth to that. So basically... What they're saying is that these guys, it's an argument to the rack systems, essentially. But when you look at this animal, this heavy body, this short stubby tail, this animal is not built for climbing trees. It does not mean that they will not, but that doesn't mean, but they don't actively do it often. So what they found is that these guys will go out, venture out, out of their little animals, out from, you know, while they're hunting at night. They do leave their space. They do utilize lots of room. That's why I advocate for four by two enclosures for single adult ball pythons as pets. But when they found these animals up in trees, it was during the dry season. There was a shortage of food. There was an overabundance of animals in the area. So they were seeking out prey where they normally would not do. So all I'm saying basically is that these are not semi-arboreal animals. Will they climb trees? Yes. Do they do it? Also yes. But is that where they normally will be found and have normal behavior? Not always the case is all I'm really saying is that you don't have to give them a six foot tall enclosure. Do I think that'd be really cool? Sure, but you probably won't find them that high ever. Moving right along. I'm actually gonna keep Kalamazoo out. I like having a little snake in my arms and I honestly don't do it enough with these um, five, with like, you know, the top five lists where I don't always have the animals in my collection. So I'm just going to keep them out for this next one. And uh, also because the last one is not going to like me very much. Um, so this next one is another lizard. And actually, I think a really good pet lizard. And that is the Euromastix. So Euromastix are found in the kind of Saharan, more arid, dry northern parts of Africa into Eurasia areas. There are quite a few different varieties of them. They're also known as the shield-tailed lizards or the shield-tailed or spiny-tailed agamas. This is another agama lizard. It's the largest wide variety of uh, lizard species out there. There are more species of agamas than anything else um, as far as lizards go. These guys are really cool, but I'm mostly referring to one species um, that is the Mali Agama, or are, there's a bunch of different ones, the Mali or Mastics. Essentially, they're usually called the Red Saharans or the Yellow Mollies. It's the same species, two different morphs. They occupy the kind of same large area, but they're the ones that you see usually most often in pet stores and honestly are probably the best pets of all of the different species. Um, these guys are really cool. They're very intermediate level ones that have very simple husbandry, but very specific requirements. These lizards require enormously high basking temps. These are the ones that do require the temps well over 100 degrees with lots of UVA and UVB lighting. However, they don't need that all of the time, but they do still need to be very warm. So you need to give them enough space to properly thermoregulate, as well as there's a lot of, uh, you know, argumentative information that is fairly misleading different ways about humidity and things like that. These are herbivorous animals. They stay a nice, easy size, about, you know, two feet-ish length from nose to tail. Um, they're really, really cool. They eat a wide variety of vegetables as well as, like, different legumes like lentils. Um, sometimes they eat little mullet and things. 
Um, as far as substrate, that's another big thing that comes from there. Um, they do very well on very fine substrate like playground sand. Um, they do very well on that because that's where they're actually found. Give them plenty of places to climb, to bask, to hide under. They do very well. And if you want a more detailed um, resource for if you want to try to keep any species of your mastix essentially, I recommend go checking out Arids Only. And I'll put their name right here. They know quite a bit. They do breed quite a few different species of Euromastix and Euromastic type lizards. Um, they know infinitely more than I do and I have no problems throwing their name there and going to go check them out. They are really, really, really cool. And now for, I'm gonna go grab the last animal on the list who I absolutely adore, but they hate me. All right, so this one, I don't show these off very much. Um, because they hate me and I'm still getting them used to being over here, not my face, please. Although you're not going to tag me from over there. Um, I'm still getting them used to being handled. So this is the Angolan Python. Um, this might be arguably the rarest animal in my collection. So these guys, um, you'll notice some, I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. So these guys are from, obviously, Angola and parts of um, Namibia. Obviously, they're getting their namesake from Angola. These guys are very closely related to the ball python. For, and you can see quite a bit of similarities. Their body style, their head shape, even a little bit of their pattern, although it's a little bit different. Um, these guys are really cool, although the space that they occupy is very different than the ball python. So Angola, Namibia, those are very dry climates. And actually the area that these guys are found is incredibly diverse. The summers or the dry season, I should say, can get well over 100 degrees in length. I'm gonna swap you around. There we go. Um, and at night, it can dip below 32 degrees. And this is, you know, in Fahrenheit. So over 130 degrees Fahrenheit, down below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But where these guys are found, is little mountainous areas, and they essentially are the perfect examples of microclimates, where they occupy small little areas under caves, outcroppings, and under rock crevices where their temperatures stay much more consistent. And these guys are really cool. And you are doing much better. Her boyfriend does not like me at all. Um, but if you look, one of the main differences, other than their climate, well, because of their environment, is their scalation. So the ball pythons have those very small, smooth, soft scales, which are really good for expanding and holding on to those mammalian pre uh, prey items. These guys also feed mostly on prey on mammalian animals, but they do feed a little bit more on birds as well. But if you look at their scales, they are more rounded and almost bead-like, and that's what they're known for is that bead-like scalation. And essentially this scalation and how tight and close knit they are is made for water retention and holding on to that. So ball pythons, they come from the very humid areas. And while yes, they do spend time in very consistent temperature and humid areas for good portions of their day, these guys do as well, but it's just drier in general. And so that's what that scalation is for. Um, these guys are known to be a little bit more diurnal, although I think that's not necessarily correct. It's more corpuscular because they will spend more time thermoregulating and basking in areas than the ball python necessarily would because of their climates. And you are just going crazy. Um, another small difference about these guys is that they usually get a little bit longer. So ball pythons, they kind of average that four and a half feet. These guys typically exceed five with a lot more regularity. Um, these guys are threatened or vulnerable, depending on... I, can, I read a couple different articles, but essentially vulnerable or threatened. Um, they are fairly rare in the hobby, both in, the, both in Europe as well as in the U.S. Um, not because they are CITES, but because of the Angolan Civil War that was going on for a very long time. And while that is over, uh, the area where these guys are found is literally riddled with landmines. So a lot of people don't really want to risk, even though the payout would be quite a bit. Um, and I mean, more so than probably a lot of like the ball python stories because of how much these guys are worth still right now. Because there are no morphs. This is what you're looking at. They are worth quite a bit more than any of the ball pythons out there right now. Um, but nobody really wants to, you know, risk dismemberment or death 
uh, to go collecting these guys, but they are starting to gain in popularity. Um, and a lot of people are doing that right now. Um, I am looking to get one more unrelated female to get a really nice trio. And hopefully I'll be doing some really cool stuff with that. Um, forgive me, it looks like I am kind of like a little bit afraid of her a little bit almost on the camera. But basically I am doing my utmost to not show a bite on video. Because even though I'm sitting here talking and explaining it, um, I don't like to show that. I don't like to contribute to that in any way. Um, and this is a good way of me moving around constantly keeping her attention not on my actual hand, moving, but not agitating or aggravating her. This is a very good way to show that while she's not entirely comfortable with handling yet, this is how we are working on that. So, hey, twofer for this one. Um, hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. If you have any questions, please let me know down below. I will 100% be making a species spotlight about the Angolan pythons. Man, it's so cool. I don't have her fully out like this as much as I should, but I'm working on it. Um, and she's just gotten so much bigger when I first got her. And she is um, a fair bit bigger than her uh, boyfriend. But yeah, I just, oh, they're so cool. I love these guys. They also typically have a little bit more of a more docile temperament, but these two don't. But we're working on it again. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this video. Um, again, I'm going to be doing all of the continents and I will probably be doing like in mainland Asia and then like in Indonesia as well as a Central and a South American because I think there's enough biodiversity of reptiles to justify that. So if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know down below. Good. Um, I do my best to not misspeak, but I do miss some things. You know, I, in the pythons may not have heard of video, I said the Timor pythons were found on the island of Timor. That is not correct. Um, lots of takes, I missed it. Um, for the European reptiles one, there was a lot of different information about the jeweled lacerta, where because we have like four or five different species that we call jeweled lacerta in the hobby, I may have had pictures of an animal of one species that didn't necessarily represent the one that I was talking about. So the people who called me out on that, thank you very much, 100% meant that, take responsibility for that, and I'm going to continue to do so to educate myself as well as educating all of you. So thank you so much, I appreciate your support, Please like and subscribe. If you can, check out my Patreon. Hope you're having a great day, and we'll check you next time.